soundguitarlessons.com. This is a chord analysis lesson for guitarists. How often do we play a chord shape but we don't know exactly what it is or why it's called, what it's called? I know this happens to a lot of us and it happened to me for a long time. The solution to that problem is not memorizing every single chord shape that exists. That would be pretty much impossible. The solution is to understand the logic of the fretboard and some simple music theory principles that we can then do, use to accurately do chord analysis on any random chord shape ever, even something we have never seen before. So I have a fail-proof chord analysis process checklist for analyzing any chord. This is the exact process that I teach in one of my courses called Chords on Command. And we're going to use that checklist right now on a piece of music from the Mel Bay book called Lenny Bro Fingerstyle Jazz. Here is Lenny Bro, the late great guitar player, one of my favorite guitar players. And this book, Fingerstyle Jazz, Lenny Bro, um, put that together with Mel Bay. I've had it sitting around for a long time and I've played through uh, some stuff. And recently I picked it up just to fiddle around with it. And I thought, ah, I'm gonna start at the beginning and kind of read this introduction again and play with this. And there's this piece of music after the introduction right here that is kind of inexplicable. It just is a nice little piece of music, but there's nothing, there's no context. It doesn't say anything about it. It doesn't say, and here's a piece of music and here's why. And no, after this, it just goes into the exercises, kind of builds everything from, from the ground up. And so I just thought it's a, it's a great kind of real world example. What if you had this resource and you're kind of plunking through it, using the tab, using whatever you need, uh, maybe recognizing some of the chord shapes, maybe recognizing that maybe you're on a chord and like, I know this is some kind of G, but what's this extra note in there? And how to, you know, what, maybe what is this? Well, we want to work through a process, ideally, that we can figure out all that information from any random new chord shape. There's a couple chord shapes in this that I almost never used that I was very pleased to stumble on and that I'm going to start uh, playing and kind of drilling more so I can have it in my vocabulary. But here is my process checklist that I teach in my course Chords on Command and that we're gonna walk through here. So let's explain through it. Now, of course, there is some prerequisite knowledge that is necessary to be able to truly do this, but I'll let you know what that is so you can slowly work towards that. But I want you to kind of watch it unfold and watch this happen. I have all the chord shapes written out for you that's coming up. Let's go through this process though. We're going to take the lowest note of a chord shape, but we're going to call it the root. You could start on any note. It's just kind of safe to take the lowest note. What we're doing is a process of elimination to figure out where the root is and from the root, the interval distances of all the other notes and then the therefore what the chord name is and the label and why it's called what it is, the quality, all of that. So I like to start with the lowest note and try it from there and you'll see how we'll move on from that if it's not the correct answer. Uh, step number two, count from that supposed root uh, to each of the other notes in the chord. So you're gonna count from it using the major scale measuring stick. Now that's a terminology I teach in the course prior to this, but it just means using the major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, knowing where the whole steps are, knowing where the half steps are, and counting up to whatever else is in the chord. So yes, the major scale, I call it the major scale measuring stick because you can use it to count to anything, even if you're not in the major scale, it doesn't matter. You could be finding a note that's flat five and go one, two, three, four, five in the major scale. Oh, it's a half step down, that's flat five. So I, I use the major scale to count to everything and that's how I teach it. So we're gonna determine what chord tone each of the other chords, uh, each of the other notes in the chord are. And we're gonna figure out what those would be if that initial note was the root, okay? And then of course, write these down if you want to um, as you're going through that process. And I'll do this all in front of you with all the chords in this. So we're gonna go through that whole thing. And then you're looking for chord tones that fill out triads one, three, five, and or seventh chords one, three, five, seven, or sus chords or obvious structures. Okay, so you're looking for threes, you're looking for fives, you're looking for sevens, um, especially because those mean that you're on the right track. Now, a lot of chords can be multiple things, so that there can be many right answers, but there's usually one really actual <laughs> right answer in the context of music. But uh, theory is theory, so you, people can say, oh, I'm thinking of this chord this way, or I'm thinking of this chord this way. But you, if you find one, three, five, it's, and that's all there is, that's a triad you have your one, three, and five, or one, three, five, seven, or some obvious stuff, but it gets really fun and interesting when there's 
other information, which there are going to be in these chords coming up. So remember that five can easily be missing from a chord shape. It's very um, common. So consider one, three, and seven to imply a complete seventh chord, even if five isn't there. Uh, that's just a little kind of extra tidbit of information. If the collection of chord tones you find does not equal an obvious chord from the spelling list. I don't, I don't have a spelling list for you here. That's one of the kind of prerequisite things that we do need to know. Spelling list just meaning how are chords spelled? And um, we need to know, like I said, one, three, five is a triad, one, three, five, seven is a seventh chord, one, three, five, six is a six chord, etc. So uh, that's stuff to learn over time. But point the point here is that if it's not adding up to something obvious, or really, if something feels a little fishy, it probably is off, it probably means the root you chose is not actually the root. Okay, so then you want to repeat this process, starting with each of the other notes in the chord until there's just a really clear answer. What I see students doing often is finding theory answers that could work, but just that are a little convoluted. And if you, they just went the next step over and tried another root, it would be an extremely obvious chord, like one, three, five, seven of something. But instead, uh, they're choosing like, oh, okay, this could be the root, and this could be the flat six, and then that could be, maybe it doesn't have a three. And it's like, yes, you can theory explain anything. But we're looking for hopefully really obvious uh, chords that we, we think in our mind, bingo, I got it, you know. Um, so if no obvious chord is spelled by checking the chord tones from each possible root, if you tried every possible note as the root and there's still nothing obvious, then it's maybe what I call an ambiguous chord or a rootless chord, which which means that the root is not in there. And we can obvious we can often interpret those however we want to. So an ambiguous chord being uh, this is really there's really no obvious um, answer here. And so something that's not there might be the root, which can give it all kinds of answers. So this is a bit of an advanced step there. So that's only if really truly there's nothing that really works very well. So if you are looking for rootless chords, you can do the same process by starting on three and then counting and looking for a three, five, and seven, and then imagining or kind of finding where that uh missing root is. Uh, I have a video about rootless chords. I will link to that in the description so you can check that out. And if you want to know about this prerequisite information that I'm talking about, it is all inside my chord theory series. And I'll put a link to that chord theory series. It's a big long series that goes from the ground up on counting with the major scale in this way, learning all about uh, chord construction and stuff like that. So this is this is kind of the fun final result of after studying all that. So here is the first chord. I wrote the whole piece out that I showed you at the beginning. I wrote it out now with chord shapes. And we're just going to go through and pretend that we kind of worked it out from the tablature or the notation or whatever. And we're sitting there with it on our guitar. On our guitar, we're playing this and thinking, what the heck is this? You know, what exactly is this chord? This is an awesome chord. Look at all these open strings that we get to play. So I'll give you kind of a spoiler alert here. Most of the chords, almost all of them, are root position in this piece of music. So we're not going to have any surprises. And that's because Lenny Bro is a solo guitar player. So he's playing, he wants to have the root in the bass a lot of times to fill out the what the bass player would play. But uh, that doesn't mean solo guitar can't play rootless voicings or inversions or something like that. You obviously can. But we're going to start on the root just because that's the process. But um, it's going to show us what color, what different notes are up above the chords. Um, and then if you went through that and it doesn't end up to be something obvious, that's when you go on to what if this is the root? Same process. What if this is the root? Same process. What if this is the root? Okay. So here's the root. This is C. We're calling it one. Okay. Now we're counting to each of these. And, and if you do this enough, you will not have to count anymore. You're just going to say, if this is one, I know that that's seven. If this is one, I know that that's five. That kind of thing is going to happen to you if you do this more. Of course, I'm doing it on a diagram in front of you. You can use diagrams. You can use uh, most likely we're actually playing the guitar and kind of counting away. So I'll give you one of this most basic prerequisite information right now, which is the major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there are half steps between three and four and half steps between seven and one. Everything else is a whole step. Boom, there's your counting measuring stick right there. That's how we find the numbers of everything else. The thing that will take a long time to get down is the nomenclature of why is a chord called what it's called. But again, I want to just have you see me kind of do this in front of you. So this is the root. Now, this we go up to 
a whole step right there. This is guitar layout stuff. So if you don't know that, that can be confusing. But from here to here is a whole step. This is one to two. Okay, so mm, is this the root? Now, I maybe shouldn't have told you already that it is. <laughs> but since I told you that it is, okay, interesting. That's two in it. So two is in the chord, which can also be nine. Uh, two and nine are the same thing. Nine is an extension. Don't worry about that extra information if it's kind of beyond where you're at right now. That's okay. Just want to show you with a lot of these videos that I put out what is possible, right? What to be, ex I just want to expose you to things. So uh, if you didn't know already that was the root, you might be like, oh, maybe it's not the right track. We're looking for threes. We're looking for fives. We're looking for sevens. Okay, well, let's keep counting. So here's two, okay? Whole step to three. That's three right there. Three to four is a half step, okay? Four to five, here's a whole step, okay? So we do need to memorize how to get across a string with a whole step. Okay, well, that's five, awesome. One, five, two, hmm, interesting, okay? If we know some of our chord spelling, we might already recognize that those three notes alone are a sus two chord, which means that the three of the chord is replaced by two. Let's keep going though. Here's five, here's six, okay? And then up a whole step is seven. This is the same note as this open string here. So seven, oh, one, five, seven. Let's keep going. One, uh, two, and then three here. Ah, we have one, we have three, we have five. That's a C major triad. Here's seven. Oh, one, three, five, seven, C major seven chord. But what's this crazy thing doing here? Okay, well, that just means we're adding a, an extension on top of the seven. It happens to be nine. Little... Uh, kind of, well, I was going to say myth, but a uh, confusion about uh, compound intervals in chords, which are the same thing as extensions. People often think if it's nine, it has to be an octave above. It does not. It can be anywhere at all. All it means is that it's two, but as a chord tone. So we have one, we have three, we have five, we have seven, and we have nine. Okay. So what would this be? This would be a Sharing the page here, C major nine chord. Okay, so the nomenclature here is that this is C major seven, but with a nine. It's not just C nine. C nine means something else. That means a dominant seventh chord with a nine. This is C major seven with a nine, which is just spelled C nine. Little tip here about the nomenclature of nines, elevens, and thirteens in the chords. If you see a chord symbol that says nine, um, unless it says add nine, it implies that the seven is there. It means the seven is there. So C major nine means C major seven with a nine. C uh, just, or C major add nine means you're skipping the seven. Okay. Now I don't expect you to retain or remember all that because I'm, uh, as I just say, little side notes and stuff, but it's all about exposure. You know, maybe when you hear that from someone else another time and another time or in another one of my videos, you, these things start to sink in or you pause it and you say, wait a second, that's just the information I was looking for. Uh, so that's why I throw so much at you. So don't hesitate to kind of take the little golden nuggets that you need from this and uh, leave the rest. Okay, let's go on to the next chord. Okay, here's the process. We're going to choose that as the root and we're going to count all the way up to here. Now, again, as you do this more, you're just going to see if this is the root, then this is flat seven. So I can just see, and I know, and I know what that sounds like, and I know what it feels like on the guitar and on the fretboard. I know that that's flat seven. Now, if you count it up from the major scale from here, and you might know some major scale shapes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven would end up here. So you're counting with the major scale regardless of what you're looking for. And then you say, ah, it's flat seven because it's down a half step. Excellent. Well, one, flat seven. Ooh, this is exactly what we're looking for. Oh no, <laughs> this is a typo in here. Please ignore that this is here. This is supposed to be here. This third string note, I'm so sorry, supposed to be right here. So please, please imagine that it's right here. That's my mistake. So this note here uh, is on the third fret instead of here. And that is the third of the chord. Because if we kept going, okay, here's flat seven, here's seven, here's one, here's two, here's three. Ah, okay, great. One, three, flat seven. This is, those three notes so far are a shell voicing of dominant seven. Uh, check out my video on shell voicings. If you haven't seen that yet, I'll put a link to it in the description, how to play any jazz chord with as few as eight shapes, if you wanted to do that. That's the beauty of shell voicings. Here's the kicker. Okay, if we keep counting up, here's three, here's four, here's five, 
Oh, it's a half step above five. Here's six. Oh, it's a half step below six. It's in between five and six. Okay, so it can be sharp five or flat six. That means that it is G flat seven, as we said here. There's the root G flat. So G flat seven, sharp five, which means dominant seven. Or G flat seven, flat 13. We don't know. The difference, the reason it would be one or the other is whether or not the five is in the chord. If there is no five in the scale, in the key, in the context, in the melody, in, in the chord anywhere, if there's no five, then it's sharp five. If there is a five in the scale that it comes from, then this note right here is flat 13, it's, which means flat six. That's uh, flat, flat six plus an octave up. That's called a compound interval. It's an extension in the chord. Um, all that stuff is covered in my chord theory series that you can check out if you want to. So we're just analyzing here. Ah, okay, cool. So you might recognize that chord shape. Sorry again that it looks different than it's supposed to, but then what is that one? That is how we do it. We do the counting process. We'll do this faster now. Here's the root. If you count up, here is major seven. If you count up, here's major third. Okay, that's F major seven. Here's the five. Yay, we get this really common shape here. And then if you count all the way up to here, here's the root again from here to here, the root. Okay, so there's nine. So we get F major, having trouble turning the slides, F major nine, because it's F major seven with a nine. So the nine implies that the seven is there because it does not say add nine, as we said before. Now, let me take this quick opportunity to share the process when it goes awry. So this is a little bit straightforward. This is giving us information like, what is that extra note that, that we don't recognize? And maybe you recognize one of these. Well, let's like start right here and say, what if you're like, I think this is the root, okay? And then you count up to here and you say, this is minor third. Ooh, awesome, minor third, that's good. This, this means that maybe it's a minor chord. And you count down to this one and you say, that's the five. Okay, one, seven, six, five, one, five, one, three. Ooh, this is a triad right here. Yeah, and maybe it looks familiar. Think of just this by itself. It's a minor triad, it's A minor, it's that A minor shape. And then you count up to this one and you say, oh, that's flat seven. Oh, this right here is A minor seven. And it is, you're right. That shape is A minor seven. That's an inversion uh, of a minor seven chord. Very common shape. And then you, and see, I, I'm really onto something here, but then you go to this one and it's flat six. You're like, okay, I have A minor seven with a flat six. And you could absolutely say this is A minor seven flat six or A minor seven flat 13, six and 13 are the same thing uh, in, in core, as chord tone language. Um, or I should say they're inharmonically the same pitch, the same note, different labels. So that is not a common chord type. A minor seven flat or a minor seven chord with a flat 13 flat seven. Theoretically, yes, you could do that. But if you call this the root, then it is just an F major nine. Like this is a more clean answer. Okay, so that is how, uh, like I said, I've seen students, things can go get a little bit crazy by using our theory knowledge and overcomplicating it. We're looking for the path of least resistance, the easiest thing. Let's do one other example. If you call this the root and you count up to here, this is five. Ooh, nice, five. If you One to five, we're looking for fives. We're looking for threes. If you count down to here, this is six. Okay, well, maybe this is a C. No, maybe this is C major six. Okay, well, this is three. Ooh, here's one, here's three, here's five, here's six. It's C major six, and actually it is C major six. That is C major six. And that right there, let's pretend this one up here, this lower note, the F is not part of it. Well, then this shape is either A minor seven or C major six equally. They have the same answer, same. It just depends on what you call the root. That's where it's kind of cool. This analysis process is cool. Okay, but let's say you say, you, you're, you're thinking this and you say, C major six, boom, got it, nailed it. Now, how about this? Ooh, that is four. If we move this up here, and we say one, two, three, four. Okay, what C major six add four? Now that's the kind of answer I'm saying I would see people do. C major six add four. Technically, theoretically, you have just explained a chord structure that can exist. C major six add four, it makes sense. Anyone, any musician who knows how to read chord symbols would see that and say, I know what to do with this. I've just never seen it before, but I know what it's asking for. But 
it's not the cleanest answer because if you just call this the root, then it's f major nine. So I hope that helps you see kind of uh, when you do this process, we're looking for that cleanest answer, but you can count off any note, call it the root and make it is technically something. Okay, it just might not be something that is musically used uh, or common or whatever. But that's the fun part about theory is that you can say, well, technically it's this with this with this with this. It's in you know whatever structure you want to say. I'll give us this one quickly. This is the note F sharp. A lot of times I'm looking for, uh, if you know your notes down here, a little hack, you can think of an octave away. If you know this is F sharp easily and that is an octave shape, you can see that as F sharp instead of needing to know right there that that was f sharp so we're kind of connecting uh what we want to analyze to something we know that's more familiar okay if we count up to this this is flat five if we count up to this this is flat seven if we count up to this this is flat three i'll just give us this one it's a pretty clean half diminished chord which is minor seven flat five same thing half diminished is this little circle with a, a line through it or minor seven flat five exact they are, they mean the exact same thing half diminished. Minor seven flat five is cool because it's so descriptive. It's a minor seven chord of the flat five. Same thing as half diminished. Uh, let's move on because we have several more chords. And um, I, I'm just going through that whole example I showed you at the beginning from the Lenny Bro book. These are the exact shapes from that little musical excerpt. Okay, this note is B. If we call it the root, I can see right away. Let's say you've been doing this for a while and you say, ah, flat seven is right there. If that's the root, that's flat seven. Okay, if that's the root, that's major third. Ah, we have a shell voicing, one and flat seven and third. This is B7. Oh, look at this. From here to here is an octave, okay? One of my big things that I emphasize in all my theory and fretboard mapping training is the octave is the most powerful physical distance and shape to understand on the fretboard because then we can manipulate things and we can analyze much easier. So this being the octave, okay, it doesn't add anything. We have straight up a shell voicing of B7. So it's missing a five, but that can be quite common. The five is often implied in a chord and it does not need to have the five in it to be functionally accurate. Uh, and a lot of chords can be missing other stuff too. You'll see we'll have another example of that, but we just have B7 here, okay? So nothing special, nothing crazy to, to analyze here. Uh, no extensions or anything. Moving on. B7. Yes, that's right. Uh, this one is also very simple, so I'll give it to us. This is E right here. So we're going to call that the root. Okay. You could count all the way up, but you'll learn as you do it more. That's the flat three right there. So be one, two. And again, I always count with the major scale. Even though I know already this is an E minor chord, I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three. Ah, this is major third. That means it's flat three. So that's why I call the major scale the measuring stick because it doesn't matter what the context you're just using it and measuring measuring everything against it, which is the perfect thing to do because it's all clean numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you flat things or sharp the notes based on what needs to be manipulated around it, what you're looking for, what you're finding. Um, okay, so this right here, uh, let's look at it this way. Here's E. We have open E up here. It's a whole step down from that. So this is flat seven. Okay, so we have root E, flat three, flat seven, oh, and flat three again. So I'm giving you this one quickly as well because there's nothing special. There's no craziness. I want to get to the cooler chords. So this is just uh, E minor seven uh, without the five. So similar, similar to the last one, uh, a kind of a shell voicing thing with a doubled note. There's an octave double. Boop, boop, octave double right there. So those are both the minor third. Okay, moving on. This also, the voice leading in this is beautiful too. Look at that. Two of those notes stay the same. One of them goes up a fourth. One of them goes down a half step. So there's really clean kind of orchestral voice leading going on here. This is A, flat seven, flat three. That shape should look familiar. It's the same shape that we had on that B7 a while back. B7, yeah, same shape, right? In fact, exactly the same shape, all four notes. Study that for one sec, and then we're moving. I apologize that my slides are going slowly. So that's A7. Okay, moving on, because I wanna, I like to be thorough and do it all, but I wanna give you the uh, cool stuff here, which is this chord is the cool one that I felt, that I stumbled on, and, and uh, because of knowing the theory analysis process like we're doing, 
I knew exactly what the chord was, but I never play this shape and I love it now after uh, going through that. So uh, that's one of the reasons I love to just pick up any random book and kind of play with it, study, even start working through simple exercises. I like to fill in little gaps or get exposed to things I haven't been using. So here's the root. If you count up, you would get this to be flat seven. Okay, we're looking at like a dominant seven type chord. If you count up, this would be two. Okay, which I'd be like, okay, or we, what, what are we getting at here? This is two. But the fact that this is three fills it in. So we have one flat, uh, we have one flat seven, three, that's a shell voicing. Okay, so we have a flat dominant seven as a shell voicing, but with a nine, so it would be called a flat nine. Okay, instead of a flat seven, a flat nine, which means it has the seven in it too, the flat seven specifically. And this is the cool note here. What is this? Well, here's a kind of a, you could count all the way up the whole scale, which is great practice. Or you could think this same note is right down here. And I'll just go, or the, or you could think this same note is up here. Either way, same thing. So this and this, because, you know, the two E strings are the same. So one, seven, six. Ah, or if you move this up here and you think one, seven, six six okay it's six six as a chord tone can be six or it can be 13 when and why is it one or the other and this is that stuff you'll have to learn over time and can study from my chord theory series or other videos of mine or other places when is six six and when is six thirteen it's completely because of whether or not the seven is in the chord if there is a seven of any kind the six is 13. If there is not a seven, then the six functions as the seven. It functions as replacing the seven. Well, we have a seven here, flat seven. So that means this right here, which is six in the scale, is called 13. That sums up the idea of extensions pretty well. Whether or not you'd call something two or nine, or four or 11, or seven, or I'm sorry, or 13 or six, is because of whether or not something else else is in there. Why would you say four instead of 11? Well, it's whether or not the three is in there. Why would you say nine instead of two? It's whether or not the three is in there. And why would you say six instead of 13? It's whether or not the seven is in there. So you don't have to understand that completely right now, but that's hopefully good exposure for you to say, ah, there's a method to the madness. Ah, there's something, there's... There's rules there, so I just gotta learn them. Great, there's hard and fast rules. Things that are not just kind of guessing and wishy-washy, which is very nice. Uh, sometimes there is that uh, wishy-washiness in theory and in music, but with uh, those extensions, there's um, clear, clear answers. So A flat 13, that means that the flat seven is in it, okay? So it's A flat seven with a 13. It's not add 13. If it said add 13, it means the seven is not there, okay? A lot of information. Um, now, same process as this one. Root, uh, flat seven, okay? Five, I'm gonna jump to that. Ooh, root, flat seven, five, this is looking good. But, so this is G here, but we don't have a third. Hmm, interesting. That's okay, it can happen. It's less common though. Usually the third is, a critical, critical note for the quality because we don't know if it's a minor third or a major third, so we kind of need that. But this shape happens to be G, a G dominant seven, and it does not have a three, and this kind of takes care of the spice, the quality. Well, G, the note is right here, the open string G. You could count all the way up from here, do whatever version to find it, but this is a great way to do it. That's G, okay, open G. Oh, it's up a half step. Okay, this is flat two then, and because it's flat two, but it's as a chord tone, it's flat nine. So this is G dominant seven, flat nine, but it doesn't have a three, but it's still just definitely G seven flat nine. It is absolutely implying that. It doesn't matter. We're not wondering if the three is flat or not because of the flat nine, okay? So all of the things I'm saying are not meant to be, you're not gonna be quizzed on it, right? It's not meant to be memorized as you go. I just hope it's, if it's up your alley and of interest to you, like, oh, this is really stuff I wanna learn. And this is hopefully helpful to, it's like you're sitting with a teacher just kind of walking through, here's the lay of the land. You know, here's an example of how it works. And the real way you get it down is the practice on your own, 
the rep repetition, the working through the roadblocks, the challenges, the trying to remember stuff that's hard uh, in real uh, applicable context for you as you're playing music. Okay, this is our second to last chord, root. This is really cool. And I know this lesson is really long, but I'm, in, I'm enjoying kind of giving you this, this presentation style lesson here. So this is the root. If we count up, this is four. Now, right away, I would be like, am I on the wrong track here? Is that the root? If this is four, weird. Okay. This is flat seven. Great. We can handle that. This is two. And now I'm wondering if we're on the right track again. Uh, but I do know this is this is a tricky one um, because it actually could be it could be several things. Um, but I know from the context of you know, the music too that I'm still going to call this the root. But let me show you how how it could be something else as well. But if this is the root, then it's B nine B flat nine says four. So this is B flat. Okay. B flat nine means that it's B flat dominant seven or B flat seven with the nine. Remember, if it says nine, it means the seven's there as well. Okay, so here's B flat the root. Okay, here is the flat seven. Here's the five. Here's that nine. Okay, the sus four is this. So if this was moved down to here, it'd be one, three, five, seven, nine. Oh, Great, one, three, five, seven, nine, or one, three, five, seven, we know is a seven chord, add nine on it, that's an extension. It just throws us off that it's also sus four, B flat nine sus four, there's the root right there. Okay, if you started here and called this the root, and let's pretend that root is all the way down here, just so you want, if we want to think of it as the low note. Okay, well then we would have root, and we would have flat three, and we would have five, and we would have flat seven, so we'd have a complete F minor seven chord, and then we have this, which would make it F minor 11. So this can be either B flat nine sus four or F minor 11, um, where in this case, the 11 is in the base. So you see how many chords can be multiple things, but a lot of times there's just a clear answer, just a clear answer. Um, and really I would, if like, in my course, for example, there's like quizzes and people will submit answers. And if someone said F minor 11, 100% correct. That's the correct answer. Like it's not. And so my interpretation here is I think of it more as B flat 9 sus 4. And that's kind of because of where it's going to. And it's going to this chord. And we don't need to spend much time here because it's the exact same chord as we started on. Um, and the thing that we're missing here with pure kind of chord analysis, chord shape analysis is chord context functional harmony. So since I mentioned it, I'll put a link in the description to my lesson on functional harmony, which is how chords function, where they're going to, uh, what are they resolving to. So B flat dominant seven resolving up a whole step to C is a common type of resolution that sounds very cool. That's kind of borrowing from another key momentarily. And, uh, and then we have our only chord in the whole thing that doesn't have the root on the bottom. So this, if we labeled it to be exact, we could say C major nine over G, C major nine slash G, you wouldn't need you don't need to put the slash chord there. That means G is the lowest note. That's just if in the chord symbol writing, you want to make sure someone who reads that chord, you want to make sure they play that lowest note on purpose, or you want a bass player to definitely play that lowest note. But otherwise, it's totally accurate to just say C major nine doesn't matter what inversion it is, what's in the bass, anything like that. Uh, so C major seven with a nine is what that means there. Uh, so that's our that's our whole process. As you can see, as we do it more and more on all these chords, it's um, it starts to be just yes, okay, I get I understand. And the thing that's missing is how when do we call what type of chord tone what how do we get really the result to those uh, nomenclatures, but you see how important navigating the fretboard with the scale is and knowing the numbers and the relationships. So even if you have some of the conventions wrong, because labels are just labels, names are just names, they're arbitrary in a lot of ways, and there's not a perfect logic to how every chord is labeled. There's just not, right? Why is C7 called C7 and C dominant seven? And this is C major seven, you know? So some of the some of the stuff is really descriptive and clear and some of it is not. So if you have your own way of thinking of it, so long as the structure is there, the, you're associating the sound with it, all of that, then uh, 
then you're fine. You're on your way. You're, on, you're understanding musical structures, right? So let's worry less about the quote unquote correct label and worry more about uh, seeing the distances, understanding how far away each of these notes are to the root, and uh, at least having that kind of scale distance understanding of it. That's that's like 90% of it. And then all the other labels and stuff, the quote unquote correct way to call things can come over time. So all of this is, is uh, stuff that I teach super thoroughly in my course called Chords on Command. And I thought it'd be cool to teach this lesson here because one, I pulled out that Lenny Bro book and there were no chord symbols on it. And uh, I wanted to share how I would analyze and just understand really clearly what all of those chords are by playing through that and kind of looking at it for a second. Uh, but also this week, my course, Chords on Command, is open uh, and it's also discounted for just this week only. I'm kind of changing the way that I'm doing my courses or promoting my courses at least because I have so many courses and I really also take focusing on my YouTube channel very seriously and, and focusing on the free lessons. I'm instead of having the courses available all the time and then promoting them sometimes with discounts, I'm closing the doors on the courses so I can focus on my free lessons and YouTube and then uh, opening the enrollment period for each course at different times throughout the year. So right now, Chords on Command is open and it is also discounted, but it closes at the end of this week. If you're watching this way later, then uh, you can just get on my email list by clicking on the link in the description and, and you'll hear about when it opens again. But if you're watching this when it comes out, then uh, you can check that out with the link in the description. Check out the, the course right now. And uh, that's if you're interested. It is an extremely linear, step-by-step, -step, thorough, process kind of end-to-end -end system that walks through how to master all of that stuff that we talked about here today but also way more it's also about how to create any chord from scratch analyze any chord from scratch all the theory from the ground up all the resources a huge workbook with uh check boxes in it so you know exactly what to work on there's no confusion um all the nomenclature and spelling lists and study and quizzes and stuff like that is all in there so that's the reason I put a course, that's the reason I make any course is to get a true solution uh, for you for one specific outcome. That's how I do courses anyway. I don't like just here's a bunch of cool information. No, I, 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 I teach plenty on my YouTube channel that's disconnected because that's the nature of one off YouTube videos. But a course is all about hey, let's get you everything you need to have this skill set super down. So Chord on Command is the theory course with a practical practical purpose, as I call it here, as you can see, uh, because it really gets to that, um, that desire of let's understand everything about the fretboard and chord names and chord symbols and how to create them and how to analyze them and figure all of that stuff out. So uh, has four modules you can see kind of the outline of the modules here and uh, just sharing it's uh, it's been around for a while students love it i'm getting comments every day and you know people uh raving about it and right now for the rest of this week it is open for enrollment and discounted and then it co closes at the end of this week and i won't open it again for months because i'm kind of rotating through what courses i open uh, click on the link in the description to learn more if you are interested and if you're not no worries at all i just hope you got something out of this lesson if that's uh, up your alley i thought it'd be fun to share this week for you i post a new lesson video every single week hope to see you in the next one thanks for watching take care and happy practicing